Okay, welcome everyone uh, to this Drug Discovery World uh, webinar entitled Real-Time Profiling of Receptor Pharmacology. Uh, as we know, receptor function is multifaceted and it is therefore highly advantageous to monitor multiple aspects in live cells and in real time. Uh, this includes uh, ligand binding, uh, secondary messenger coupling, uh, and recruitment of scaffolding proteins such as arrestins, uh, internalizations, and uh, trafficking. So today's webinar will detail the latest advances in microplate uh, reader-based technology to monitor receptor pharmacology, particularly using bioluminescence resonance energy transfer, uh, obviously in short breadth. Um, so today we're delighted to have a panel of three experts to discuss this topic in, in greater depth. Um, so let's meet them. Uh, first up, we have Dr. Thomas uh, Maclight uh, from Promega. Um, secondly, and all the way from Australia, we have Associate Professor uh, Kevin Flager. Uh, and last but not least, Carl Peters uh, from BMG LabTech. Uh, I'm Robert Jordan, publisher and editor-in-chief of Drug Discovery World, DDW, and I'm going to serve as your moderator. Uh, at any time... During the webinar, you can send in your questions for our panelists by writing uh, your questions in the Ask a Question box and obviously pressing OK. Uh, the panel will try and answer as many of your questions as time permits at the end of the presentations. Okay, so I think we're ready to go. Um, so if you're all sitting comfortably at your screens, let's get started. Uh, our first speaker is Dr. Thomas Maclight. Um, so if you're ready, Thomas, the floor is yours. Hello, my name is Thomas Machleit. Um, I'm a senior scientist at the Promega Corporation, and I work for the Advanced Technologies Group. Um, and I, today I will start this presentation with an overview of a bread and nano bread technology specifically. There can't be any doubt about the importance of protein-protein interaction. They are critical to all physiological processes. From a drug discovery perspective, there are potentially hundreds of thousands of constitutive and dynamic protein-protein interaction which provide a rich source, um, target source for therapeutic intervention and modification of biological processes. Yet the protein-protein interaction-based drug discovery remains somewhat challenging, um, most importantly due to the limited number of scalable assays for protein-protein interaction and the lack of chemical space specific for targeting protein-protein interaction. Now the next slide shows a quick overview of the technology landscape for protein-protein interaction analysis. Um, these methods can be split roughly into two areas. The first one consists of biological or biophysical methods um, that allow in vitro analysis and endpoint analysis of protein-protein interaction. The second set comprises of methods that allow um, the measurement of dynamic protein-protein interaction. Despite the relative wealth of methods, most methods are currently limited by the ability to use them in screening environment, by their sensitivity, by their dynamic range specificity, robustness, and physiological relevance, as well as the ability to conduct real-time analysis. Now, one of the methods that is commonly used is resonance energy transfer. So how does uh, resonance energy transfer, in particular bio, um, bioluminescence resonance energy transfer, work? BRET is one of the many variants of resonance energy transfer, which is the radiation-less transfer of energy between two lumiophores. In the case of bioluminescence resonance energy transfer, or BRET, the lumiophore comprises of a luciferase as a donor and a fluorescent molecule as an acceptor. Now, the efficiency of resonance energy transfer is determined by three principal parameters. <clears throat> First, spectral overlap um, between the donor emission acceptor excitation, which is shown in the spectrum um, shown here on the slide. Um, this is a spectrum of Nanolac and Oregon Green as an example for a donor acceptor pair. You can clearly see the spectral overlap between um, the nanoluck emission and organ green excitation as the orange colored area. The second parameter is the spatial positioning and orientation of donor and acceptor relative to each other. 
And lastly, and most important, is the distance between the donor and the acceptor. One important constant in that regard is the R0 value, which is the distance at which resonance energy transfer occurs with 50% efficiency. This distance varies depending on the specific donor acceptor pair between 3 and 8 nanometers. Equally important is the fact that resonance energy transfer efficiency is inverse, inversely proportional to the sixth power of distance. Consequently, even small changes in distance will translate into major changes in bread efficiency. The scale at which bread occurs <clears throat> and its exquisite sensitivity to changes in distance make bread very well suited to measure interactions between macromolecules. Measuring bread is rather simple. All that is needed is an instrument that is capable of measuring luminescence in two channels, one for donor emission, which is here depicted in blue, and one for acceptor emission, which is depicted in red. The sample spectra provide an example how signal changes in the presence or absence of an acceptor are measured. In the absence of an acceptor, you'll get a large signal in the donor channel and a small signal in the acceptor channel. Please note that the signal in the acceptor channel originates from spectral breathsu of the donor into the acceptor channel and should be considered background. The amount of donor background is dependent on the spectral separation between donor and acceptor and will ultimately determine the dynamic range of a breadth system. In simple terms, breadth systems with poor spectral resolution suffer from limited dynamic range. Now, in the presence of the acceptor, you still retain a portion of the donor signal. Also, this plot shows spectra normalized for donor emission, but in reality, the donor signal would decline somewhat. But now, with energy transfer occurring, you get a substantial increase of signal in the acceptor channel. This change can be easily captured by calculating the ratio of the acceptor signal over donor signal. Any increase of acceptor signal relative to donor signal would result in an increase of the bread ratio. Also, the ratio of the raw emission values are frequently referred to as bread ratio, which is not entirely correct since it includes the spectral breed-through from the donor into the acceptor channel. <clears throat> now, to obtain the true or corrected bread ratio, um, you have to subtract the ratio obtained from the donor control in complete absence of an acceptor from the ratio you measured in your actual sample. <clears throat> now, why is bread um, uh, so suitable for measuring protein-protein interaction? We can answer that question by comparison um, to other methods. First of all, it allows real-time measurement in living cells. That can be achieved with other methods like such as like mass spectrometry pull-down, SPR, or time-resolved FRET. The second reason is that ratiometric assay formats in general mitigate input variation, for instance, due to varying cell number, etc. Um, other in intensity-based assays um, don't, don't provide this type of correction. Um, an example for that would be protein fragment complementation assays. As pointed out before, um, bread is extremely sensitive towards changes in distance. Other methods such as mass spec and pull down um, don't really give you any information about distances or if two protein directly interact. Um, it could be purely incidental that you get uh, signals. There is no physical interaction between donor and acceptor that goes back to protein fragmentation complementation assays. Um, which require actually a complementation of your reporter, that complementation itself can add to the dynamic interaction of the pair of interest. Now, BRAT has been around for quite some time. Um, there are a number of known BRAT systems. The probably most commonly used are BRAT1 and BRAT2. Now, BRAT1 combines uh, renilla luciferase with um, YFP, it gives you, in general, good resonance energy transfer efficiency due to the spectral proximity of both donor and acceptor. However, as I pointed out before, because um, both donor and acceptor are spectrally so close together, it gives you very high spectral breed-through. Um, it is also due to the relative um, weakness of uh, renilla luciferase gives you only intermediate to low signal strength and stability. Now, that system provides you with intermediate sensitivity but very limited dynamic range. A second system was um, developed, it's called BRAD2, that combines renilla um, with a particular substrate, cilantrozine HH. That substrate uh, shifts the emission of renilla luciferase to 400 nanometers. 
That is combined with GFP2, which has an excitation maximum around 400 nanometers and an emission of 550 nanometers. It gives you intermediate resonance energy transfer. <clears throat> now you have a great uh, um, spectral separation between the donor and the acceptor, um, so it, you get very little spectral breathe through. But um, due to the uh, um, properties of the substrate, you get very poor signal strength and stability, meaning that your signal decays rapidly. Now you get very limited sensitivity with the system, but good dynamic range. So we thought that um, Promega's technology would allow to improve um, the BRET technology, um, and we took a two-pronged strategy to achieve that. First of all, we replaced vanilla luciferase with a new luciferase called Nanolac. Nanolac is extremely bright. The graph below shows you that it is 130 times brighter than vanilla luciferase and at least 30 times brighter even than modified improved version of vanilla luciferase such as uh, ARLAC8. It has glow kinetics, so it emits a stable signal. It is also very small. It's about half the size of vanilla luciferase, so it uh, is less likely to interfere with protein function as in fusion. It has extremely high physical stability and is very adaptable to different assay formats. Um, on the acceptor side, we changed the paradigm of using fluorescent proteins completely, and we used a second Promega technology to introduce an acceptor, um, and we used for that Halotech technology. Now, Halotech is a um, modified bacterial dehalogenase that undergoes a suicide reaction with a chloralkane. That chloralkane can be substituted with all kinds of chemical payloads, and of course, in this case, we used a fluorophore as a payload. We developed a ligand called Nanobrate 618 Halotech ligand, which is spectrally very well resolved from um, Nanolac, uh, which gives us great um, dynamic range. Now, the brightness of Nanolac allows us that we sacrifice some of the spectral overlap and such some of the um, resonance energy transfer um, efficiency in order to achieve that spectral separation. To give you one example of nanobread versus bread one um, in regard to dynamic range, we tested it in a uh, very well-defined system using FKBP and FRB. FKBP is a small um, um, immunophilin. Um, FRB is um, the um, is a portion of the mTOR kinase um, which binds to rapamycin. Um, Upon binding of rapamycin, FRB and FKBP are associated very tightly in a trimeric complex. This particular system has been used uh, to assess uh, the performance of a lot of systems uh, that are intended to measure protein-protein interaction. So we compared it by creating a set of fusion, uh, fusing FKBP to the acceptor, which is Halotech or YFP respectively, or FRB to Nanolac to the donor Nanolac and ARLAC. Um, and then we basically measured um, the change in um, BRET ratio upon addition of a dose response of rapamycin. And as you can see in um, this dose response experiment, uh, by converting the BRET ratios to signal to background ratios relative to the untreated sample, you get a much bigger increase with the nano-bread system uh, compared to the bread one system and substantially increased um, dynamic range. Now, we have extensively published on this technology. It can be found in a recently published paper in ACS Chemical Biology. And of course, on our website, we have extensive information about the nano-bread system and lots of different application examples. Now, nanobread, the workflow for nanobread technology for as a protein-protein uh, interaction assay is fairly simple. Um, it starts with the generation of different, uh, different expression constructs. I want to stress here that due to the um, requirements for spatial orientation of donor and acceptor, all combinations of donor and acceptor fusions need to be tested. Then you transiently transfect the donor and acceptor constructs. Uh, you transfer the cells into the desired plate format. Um, you uh, also treat the cells or add to the cells the nanobread 618 ligand um, at a concentration of 250 nanomole. You incubate for a brief period of time and then induce your protein-protein interaction if it's a dynamic interaction and it needs an inducer. 
Um, after the desired incubation time, you add a 5-fold nanoglow nanobread reagent and 5x nanoglow nanobread reagent, um, and then measure the emission at 460 and 610 nanometer, respectively. Now, the use of an organic fluorophore as an acceptor provides a lot of opportunities that go beyond um, measuring simple protein-protein uh, action. We can use that organic uh, fluorophore uh, to label antibodies. We can use it, of course, to label proteins directly. We can use it to label proteins through halotech, but we can also use it to label small molecules. And that allows you to develop a very broad platform in which not only protein-protein interaction but any type of protein-ligand interaction can be measured. And to illustrate that point, um, I show you here an example for the EGFR receptor. So imagine you fuse EGFR receptor at the C-terminus to nanolac. Now, if you combine it, for instance, um, you want to measure the interaction of EGFR receptor with one of its adapter protein. In that case, you would fuse an adapter protein such as GRAB2 to halotag. And then upon uh, activation of EGFR, you can measure the binding of GRAB2 um, to, EG, to the EGFR um, via BRET. However, you could also look at phosphorylation events um, by using a phosphor-specific antibody. In this case, you would label the phosphor-specific antibody or a secondary antibody uh, with the nanobred 618 ligand. Um, and then basically upon stimulation of EGFR, um, you have to lyse the cells, add your antibody, and you can measure the phosphorylation by adding the labeled phosphor-specific antibody in a fully homogeneous format. Lastly, you can develop target engagement assay for um, small molecule uh, binders. Um, and here, for instance, let's say you develop um, small molecule binder and kinase inhibitor against EGFR. You amend it with the fluorophore. Now you can directly measure the binding of a small molecule um, uh, towards EGFR, the kinase portion of EGFR. Lastly, you could, of course, also label the end terminus of EGFR with nanoluck. That would allow you to measure directly the binding of EGF to EGFR by um, uh, creating a um, fluorophore labeled EGF. And then upon addition of EGF to your EGFR expressing cells, you could measure the binding of EGF to the nanoluck EGFR fusion um, by looking at the BRET ratio. And this concludes my part of the presentation, and I will hand it over now to the next presenter. He will tell you a little more detail about how this technology can be applied. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thomas, and welcome. So I'd like to talk today about real-time profiling of receptor pharmacology. My name is Associate Professor Kevin Flager. I'm Head of Molecular Endocrinology and Pharmacology at the Harry Pogues Institute of Medical Research in Perth and also the University of West Australia. And I'm also Chief Scientific Advisor of Dimerex Limited. I'd like to start off by just acknowledging a few disclosures. Um, and it's very pertinent to this talk because a lot of this work has been done in close collaboration with the University of Nottingham, uh, Promega, BMG Lab Tech, and more recently, with the University of Queensland and Dimerix. And I'm, as I mentioned, Chief Science Advisor of Dimerix and a shareholder as a consequence. I'm going to talk you through various aspects of molecular pharmacology profiling, in no particular order, but uh, binding, coupling to G proteins, recruitment of arrestins, internalization, trafficking, recycling, and heteromerization. All of these are able to be carried out using the BRET technology. So what is BRET? Bioluminescence Resonance Energy Transfer. It's a process where we can label a protein of interest, such as a receptor, with a luciferase molecule. This is a donor for the BRET technology. We can then label an acceptor onto an interacting protein of interest. So this acceptor is generally a fluorescent protein, but can actually be another um, fluorophore as well. The concept is that as a ligand binds to our protein of interest, such as a receptor, you get recruitment of the arresting molecule up and interacting, and that brings the donor and acceptor into very close proximity. If that happens, you now have resonance energy transfer occurring. 
This is non-radiative and it only happens if these two molecules are in very close proximity, within about 5 to 10 nanometers. That means that energy transfer then occurs and we get a longer wavelength light emission. So more in the, the yellow or even through to the red, depending on the fluorophore we use. This means that when we see that light at that longer wavelength, we're seeing this energy transfer and therefore we're seeing a protein-protein interaction, as was uh, nicely described by Thomas a moment ago. The great advantage of bioluminescence for energy transfer is that we can do it in live cells in real time. And we can do that by using a luminometer, and in particular we use BMG instruments such as the Claris star and the Ferris star. And you can use uh, fusion proteins, cDNAs, generate your donor acceptor cDNA constructs, transfect cells, put them into a 96 well plate or even a 384 or higher, put them into a, a, a luminometer, and then measure light through different wavelength channels. So with filtered light, we measure through the blue or um, the yellow, or it could be uh, red or longer. And we're actually looking to, to measure and generate a ratio, as again was described by Thomas a moment ago. What I'd like to do now is take you through a few examples where we're actually using the Brett technology to profile in real time in live cells and actually understand some different aspects of what's happening in the cell. So I'll start with profiling clinical mutations in vasopressin 2 receptors. Here we're looking at V2R mutations, and this, these are some of the examples we focused on. Some of them cause a uh, loss of function uh, disease condition, so we have nephrogenic diabetes insipidus, or di uh, NDI. This is loss of function, and it occurs with these mutations R137H, R181C, and M311V. There's also a gain of function disorder, which is NS. IAD or NCAD, which is nephrogenic syndrome of inappropriate antidiuresis. And again, this happens at the R position, but this time with R137C or L. And also more recently, we've published with the R312S mutation. We've also characterized a mutation or a polymorphism at V266A, and this uh, is associated with patients or a patient with um, NSIAD, but we actually think this is probably not disease-causing. So to show you some of the pharmacology, here's a publication in molecular endocrinology, and this is showing real-time Brett analysis using arresting recruitment to the V2R receptor. So here we're looking at real-time, we're adding antagonist, and we're seeing um, a reduction in the ligand-induced Brett signal. Uh, on, the, on the first panel here in A, we're seeing the wild-type receptor. In B, we're seeing the C mutation. In C, we're seeing the L mutation, and then D, the H mutation. And you can see there's this constitutive recruitment of rest in, in each case. And this is also reflected on the right-hand side in the confocal microscopy. Now you can always look at this in, um, in real time, and this is the beauty of Brett, because you can actually generate kinetic profiles. And you can see this at the different concentrations, the wild type profile on the left, and then coming across the screen we have the R181C, where we have this complete uh, loss of arrest in interaction. We have this polymorphism, which looks very similar to wild type. And then interestingly, we have the M311V mutation, which gives us this different kinetic profile and that actually has an intermediate phenotype in the patients. Here we have um, some follow-up in terms of cytokine P, phosphate and arrestin, and again the Clario star is, is an uh, instrument of choice for us doing these TR-FRET-based assays, and here we can actually see um, the cytokine P shift in the, the potency, and that is different for nostol phosphate, and arrestin gives a similar profile, in fact, to the nostol phosphate profile, and this arrestin is with the BRET. So here we can see a different profile for the different uh, endpoints, 
and you can actually see the V266A is similar to wild type, the M311V is intermediate, and then the R181C still has a maximum uh, cytokine P response, but is right shifted. In contrast with the inositol phosphate and the arrestin, the R1181C, we're completely losing uh, that signal. So now if we look at the L312S mutation, here we're looking at a comparison between the alucate venous combination, the nanoluc venous combination, and the nanoluc halotag combination. And the halotag here we have a red fluorophore attached to it. And you can see that we have similar pharmacology regardless of which system we use. But interestingly we have a very clear constitutive signal with the alucate and venous and the nanoluc halotag. Not quite so obvious constitutive signal, although it is there for the nanoluc venous combination. So now we can look at that in terms of kinetics. Here we can see the different doses going across the screen for the alucate venous, nanoluc venous, and nanoluc halotag. And we can see here, if we compare that down the bottom with the C mutation, we can see this constitutive signal again. And then as we flick through to the next one, you can see the L also again has this constitutive um, signal. And then finally, if we look at the combination with the S, we can see that constitutive signal is no longer there. But we have similar kinetics across regardless of which particular combination of donor receptor we use. So the reason we have this uh, mutation causing the phenotype, it's all about cytokine P. And that's shown here. We have the L312S giving us this constitutive cytokine P signal. We don't see a constitutive inositol phosphate signal. And the cytokine P, as you can see here down the bottom, we have this constitutive signal with the black bar raised with the mutation. And then we have this reduction with the tolvaptin inverse agonist. Now moving towards trafficking, here we have a, a combination of KRAS attached to a fluorophore, and this time venous, and we have our receptor on the plasma membrane attached to a donor, uh, this time alucate. So this is a, a, a situation that was published first by Nevin Lambert, and the idea is that you can actually have the proximity assessed through the non-specific interaction or the non-specific proximity of the BRET. So the KRAS is effectively lying in the plasma membrane like a, like a little minefield, and there's enough of it that regardless of where the uh, receptor is with the donor, it, it will be proximal to a KRAS and therefore give a signal, whereas when that receptor comes off the membrane, it goes into another compartment, comes away from the, the KRAS, you lose that signal. Now we've we've uh, kindly been uh, given constructs by Nevin uh, and and used some of those, and we've also expanded that portfolio to now cover a whole different range of compartments. So we have Rab5 and Rab4 in the early endosome, which is the compartment that has the EEA1 marker. We have Rab11 in the recycling endosomes, uh, which is the mark marked by transferrin. We have late endosomes with Rab7 and Rab9, which is marked by lysotracker, uh, as is the lysosome with Rab7. And then across here, we have RAB1 in the endoplasmic reticulum, uh, and then Cis-Golgi marked by the GM130 marker, where RAB6 is located, and then we have RAB8 uh, in the Trans-Golgi network. And to show that those are correctly located here, we have a flag tag V2R showing co-localization with the KRAS venous, and the merging there showing it nicely co-located on the membrane, the plasma membrane. And then to validate the other compartments, we have the early, early endosome um, marked with the EEA1 marker with the RAB4 and the RAB5. We have the RAB1 um, with the GM130 marker, so that's in the, um, the Golgi. And the RAB8 is not co-located with the GM130 because if, if we consider the, the previous figure, the RAB8 is actually located um, in the trans-Golgi network, so we do not expect it to be co-located with a GM130 marker, and indeed that's what we see. 
So coming back to that slide, we have this. We don't have co-location the RAB8 and the G130. The RAB9, though, is located with the lighter tracker, RAB11 with transferrin. And the beauty of BRET, again, is the real-time nature, so we can actually track these different um, markers through the different compartments. So we have KRAS, the plasma membrane, as the receptor is activated, it is internalized and comes off the membrane. You see that in panel A. And then it goes through a different compartment. So it goes through the RAB5 compartment in D uh, first, uh, then followed by RAB4 compartment, which is shown in C. And then it will start going into later compartments, so the RAB7 compartment and later on RAB11. And mean, meanwhile, you have um, increased uh, signal from the endoplasmic reticulum with the RAB1. Interestingly, we don't see a change in signal with RAB8 and RAB6, and this may be reflecting a steady state situation, so there's no net change in that particular compartment. So now I'd like to move on to heteromerization and, and a novel approach to studying these complexes. Firstly, the definition of receptor heteromerization. This was decided by a group that met uh, and then published subsequently in Nature Chemical Biology. And the definition agreed was that a receptor heteromer is a macromolecular complex composed of at least two functional receptor units with biochemical properties that are demonstrably different from those of its individual components. So this, this is a large complex, illustrated here in a very simple way by two receptors, but there are likely to be multiple other proteins involved. The minimal uh, unit for it to be a heteromer, there should be two functional receptor units there. And as a consequence of there being two receptors, there is some kind of allosteric modulation which results in different biochemical properties compared to if those receptors were expressed individually. There could be direct receptor interactions, but there could just as easily be other proteins in between the receptors and those proteins could be at the level of the membrane, it could be another receptor, or it could be adapted proteins across, uh, for example, intracellularly. But the idea is there is some way that allosteric modulation can be transferred from one receptor to another in this complex. So what are the implications for this? If we have a GPCR in isolation in the membrane, we screen compounds against that. A particular compound is likely to have a particular effect, so compound A would have effect A. However, if there are uh, heteromer complexes forming, there could be allosteric modulation occurring between these, and a particular ligand A could still have its effect A, but it could also transactivate GPCR B and have a different effect, or indeed have a completely different effect AB, showing different pharmacology altogether. So now we have a situation where we're going from this concept of a GPCR signal, so a particular GPCR that is interacting with a certain G protein. So we used to talk about angiotensin receptor as being a GQ coupled receptor, but now we talk more about profiles. We talk more about a GPCR interacting through potentially multiple different G proteins and also potentially through a resin as well. So we now have this concept of biosignaling where potentially a ligand could be interacting with the receptor and giving a different signaling profile compared to a different ligand binding the same receptor. Now this process and this concept extends to heteromerization. And because of this change in pharmacology due, due to allosteric modulation, we could have different coupling to G proteins and different coupling to arrestins. So this is still biosignaling, but it is as a consequence of heteromerization. So we've considered this and tried to come up with a way of actually interrogating this, these particular com complexes in a way that gives us ligand dependency. So we've taken a receptor A, we've added a first reporter component, so this could be a donor for Brett, for example, and then we've taken the second receptor, receptor B, and we haven't labeled it, but instead we've put the second reporter component onto an interacting group. So the first and re second reporter components are two components of a proximity-based system. They could be BRET, 
but this could also be FRET or the enzyme fragment commentation system or the Tango system or a split cifrase or a split fluorophore system. So any system which gives you a proximity readout when you have two reporter components coming into close proximity. And the idea is that when a ligand binds to the receptor B, you get activation. The interacting group here is translocated and interacts or a conformational change occurs, changing the interaction with the receptor complex. And as a consequence, you get a change in proximity of the first and second reported components that then gives you a readout that you can measure. This is the, the particular configuration for intracellular signaling. But we can also just as easily flip it over the other way so that the first reporting component is now extracellular, the second reporting component is attached to a ligand, so this is essentially a fluorescently labelled ligand. And now our ligand, uh, which is not labelled, is competing off this interacting group or this fluorescently labelled ligand, and as a consequence we have a heteroma selective competition assay. So it's exactly the same concept, but in terms of binding. So to illustrate this for Brett, we have our receptor A with a luciferase, our receptor B untagged, our, our YFP attached to a restin. The ligand binds selectively for uh, the receptor B or the heteroma, and as a consequence, we get a ligand-induced Brett signal from this particular conformation. Now, in a cell situation, you will get all sorts of different complexes. At a simplistic level, if there's just the two receptors, you will also get receptor A homomers, but these will not give you a signal because the ligand binding, or well, the ligand doesn't bind, and therefore we don't have acceptor translocating and, and interacting. In contrast, receptor B homers will uh, activate uh, on, on addition of the ligand, but even though they're recruiting the acceptor, there's no donor present and therefore no signal. So these uh, two homers are kept in the dark and we have this selective signal from the heteroma complex. Here I've just put up uh, the front cover of Assay and Drug Development Technologies and a list of original articles and reviews and book chapters that we've published using um, and describing Receptor HIT. This is an illustration where Receptor HIT has been used to look at GI coupling. So this is the CCR281 heteroma. Here we have um, the change in breadth signal induced by the CCL2, and you can see this, this increase, uh, well, this increased change in breadth signal, it's actually a, a decrease, but I've shown as an increase here for simplicity. We have this change that is ligand-dependent and dose-dependent, and in the absence of angiotensin uh, receptor, the addition of ang2 doesn't make any difference, and you can see this flat line across the top, where you have CCL2 at maximal dose, and then ang2 as a as a as a change in, in doses. Down in D, however, we have the um, 81 receptor present. So now if you have GR4I, RLUC8, and CCR2YFP, you again see this uh, dose-dependent increase in BRET when we have the CCL2 added. And again, this is a change in BRET signal, but we see the opposite happening. If, if uh, CCL2 is, is present in at 100 nanomolar, and then we're adding the ANG2 in a dose-dependent manner, we see this inhibition of that uh, signal. So this in implies that the activation of the angiotensin receptor is somehow inhibiting the function of the CCR2 receptor. We can then see the receptor hit with the arrestin. And again, similar confirmation as we described before, here we have um, the presence of AT1 and we have this uh, heteroma uh, complex. So if we look at that in terms of the readout, we have this uh, arresting recruitment to CCR2, but in the presence of AT1, the addition of ANG2 gives us this, this increase in breadth signal, but the addition of both ANG2 and CCL2 in combination gives us a much larger signal.
and to to come full circle and um, tie in the trafficking with the the heteroma concept here we have an illustration where we have the 81 receptor with our locate and we can see the internalization away from the plasma membrane where we have less proximity to the KRAS tagged with Venus and then we have trafficking to the RAB5, RAB7 and RAB11 compartments and then if we then show the AT2 receptor again tagged with ILU-8 we see uh, no internalization and this is to be expected from the literature but the interesting thing is if we have the AT2 uh, still labeled but this time introducing AT1 if the AT1 is not having any effect at all, then we would expect to still see no effect uh, of um, ligand-induced, uh, no, no ligand-induced internalization or translocation to different compartments. But actually, and interestingly, we see this um, increase in signal at the plasma membrane. So we actually have um, the opposite effect. We have uh, an increase in alucate 81 at the membrane due to the presence of the AT1 receptor. Now our working hypothesis for this is that we have internalization of the AT1 and then we have more trafficking of the AT1, AT2 complex up to the membrane and therefore this increase in the AT1, AT2 complex and therefore more alucate uh, at the plasma membrane in proximity to the KRS venus. So now I'd like to, to move on to the Brett ligand binding assay and this is work we've published recently in Nature Methods and this is a fantastic collaboration with Promega and uh, BMG and the University of Nottingham. And here we have, um, just to illustrate this, we have the, the Nanoluc uh, having a Brett signal across to the fluorescent ligand which is bound to the GPCR and that's competed off with unlabeled ligand. So here we have um, the nanobret, here we have um, alucate on the, the end terminus of the B2 adrenergic receptor and we're not seeing any signal here but if we have instead uh, the nanoluc on the end terminus we're actually now seeing uh, a nice specific uh, dose dependent signal and this is, uh, we have a signal peptide that, that is enabling that um, expression of the nanoluc on the end terminus. Here you can see it with the BY630 fluorophore and comparing that with the BYFL fluorophore. And you can see there is a similar pharmacology. Um, but the difference is that uh, the BY630 is much more red shifted and therefore we have very little background. Whereas the BYFL is, is not so red shifted and therefore we have this, this increased overlap between spectra and therefore this um, higher um, background. And this is just illustrated here. So if we do actually have uh, the zero on the bottom here, and you can see, even though it's similar pharmacology, we have a uh, much lower background with the BY630, illustrating why it's a good idea to go to red in these situations if you can. And this illustrates here a couple of aspects of the nanoluc compared to alucate. Firstly, we have this slight shift to the blue, which gives us better better um, signal separation or spectral separation but more importantly um, this is illustrated in terms of the luminescence on the right hand side so here we have the nanoluc signal <coughs> being much higher than the RLUK8 signal and in this particular assay it was about 70 fold so we're looking at a much stronger signal and this means that even though um, we, we are losing signal or losing donor signal down as we come towards the 600 wavelength it's still appreciably higher than alucate which means that we can then transfer energy across to these red fluorophores it's unclear why the nanoluc is um, better than alucate although uh, a working hypothesis is that um, it is to do with expression and the ability of the NLUC to uh, actually 
be expressed and folded properly on the end terminus. And this may be part of its evolution. The nanoluc is evolved to um, to be squirted out by by the shrimp in the deep sea, and it's probably evolved to be able to um, exist and, and configure appropriately in the external environment. Whereas the alucate um, is intracellular and therefore perhaps not quite so happy outside the cell. You can see here the saturation binding, so very nice binding curves here with very low um, background, and there are many orders of magnitude here that simply wouldn't be able to be uh, generated uh, with radioligand binding. So um, some very nice um, pharmacology here, <clears throat> and we illustrate here uh, with the panel C, and this is work um, from the University of Nottingham with my collaborator Stephen Hill and Lee Stoddard. Um, here we have the the background with the, the A1 receptor, and that is giving us a nice um, negative control. And we have here, um, again, appropriate pharmacology of these different ligands for the adenosine receptors A1 and A3. And this works nicely as well for uh, an agonist as well as antagonist, and that is illustrated down the, the bottom here with the, the ABEA uh, compound. And the the wonderful thing again about Brett is that it's it's very good for real time, and this is also the case for binding. So here we have real time assays, and this kind of approach gives you similar KDs compared to the saturation experiments. And finally, um, interestingly, the A1 receptor and the A3 receptor using different uh, fluorophores, there's not a lot of difference with the A1, but there is a difference with A3, and this may actually reflect um, some cooperativity in the complex, particularly potentially, with homo homorization. So illustrating this now with um, the angiotensin 2, so also works very nicely with peptides. The Tamra Ang2, um, and we can see with various different uh, ligands, both antagonists and agonists, you can see some nice uh, pharmacology here. So just illustrating this, we have the Tamra Ang2 ligand and the Brett signal coming across from the nanoluc. And as we increase the concentration of almosartin, this is competed off. And you can actually see this nicely on the left-hand side with the figure. As you increase the dose of almosartin, we're now seeing um, the competition uh, and this was all done with Ferristar. Now with the PD123319, this molecule actually is selected for AT2 receptor, so we don't expect it to compete off the Tamra Ang2, and in fact that's what we see here, so we don't see uh, the competition. Now in terms of the, the receptor hit, again as I mentioned before, it can be carried out with ligand binding as well. And so we have now, we have the nanoluc uh, giving us a Brett signal with the Tamra, but now the Tamra is, is actually bound to the angiotensin 2 type 2 receptor because we have a maximal dose of omosartin blocking it binding to the AT1. And if you um, then add the PD compound, this competes off the Tamra Ang2, and so that again shows the selectivity for the AT2 uh, receptor. And you can see that here. So we have one micromolar omosartin blocking the AT1 receptor. So this competition uh, with the PD123319 is due to uh, the competing off of the Tamra Ang2 from the AT2 receptor. And then finally, just as an additional control, here we have the um, AT1 and the AT2 receptors. Um, we have the uh, AT1, AT2 heteroma combination. And then comparing that to the AT2 receptor combination uh, alone. And of course, um, we're, we're interested to see if we have the, a similar um, potency. And indeed, we do. So we have 
uh, no significant difference between having uh, binding to the AT1, AT2 heteroma versus binding to the um, AT2 receptor and displacement with this PD123319. So with that, um, I'd like to acknowledge the people that did the work, uh, current and uh, uh, selected people from uh, my lab from the past, and indeed a whole uh, range of collaborators both in industry and in academia, and of course all my funding bodies, and I'd be very welcome to uh, answer questions at the end, uh, but now I'd like to hand over to Carl. Thank you very much. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, to conclude this webinar, I will spend a little time telling you about a couple of microplate readers that we think will help you in detecting your BRET assays. As we have seen today, the BRET system, while extremely useful for a wide variety of applications, it is also associated with a number of challenges. The low signal makes sensitive detection important, which in turn means that selecting the optimal wavelength is important. This wavelength optimization needs to be done for a variety of donors and acceptors that may be used in your particular BRET assay. Because of the challenges that are involved in detecting BRET, it is desirable to collect as much light as possible, making filter-based instruments preferred. Typically, monochromator-based instruments perform poorly, as seen in the panel on the right. However, the ClarioStar has been found to be the sole monochromator-based plate reader suitable for this challenging assay. I will focus my portion of the webinar on the ClarioStar and the Ferristar FSX, the two BMG re readers that were employed to collect the data shown today. In general, the ClarioStar is used for assay development, while the Ferristar FSX has a number of, ad of advantages that make it an excellent choice for high-throughput screening. Although our focus today is on BRET assays, both readers exhibit excellent performance in the multiple modes shown here. Both readers lead the way in sensitivity as measured by limit of detection. This extends to bottom reading, where a true, direct, free air optical path allows for outstanding sensitivity in all modes. And switching between top and bottom reading is controlled in the software with ease. No need for additional hardware installation to enable bottom reading. The key attribute of the ClarioStar is a monochromator based on linear variable filters. In essence, this system allows you to create filters within the instrument that have the wavelength of your choosing with a bandpass up to 100 nanometers. For fluorescence experiments, the appropriate wavelength for excitation and emission of your fluorophore can be selected, and an adjustable dichroic assures that all characteristics are optimized for performance in your assay. For BRET experiments, multiple emission wavelengths can be selected and the ability to select wide band passes is especially useful for sensitive, te sensitive detection of the lumophores with broad emissions in these experiments. By implementing LVF technology in a plate reader and combining it with the best possible light handling, there is a significant improvement in the amount of light lost by the ClarioStar. This is depicted graphically in the top figure. The bottom figure gives you an idea of the benefit that can be derived from being able to, to adjust to any wavelength and bandpass. The LVF monochromator lets you choose the best possible wavelength and bandpass for your experiments. The high performance enabled by the LVF monochromator, along with the excellent dynamic range in luminescence, all contribute to the ClarioStar's ability to detect BRET assays when other monochromator-based readers cannot. Further utility is provided by the spectral scanning capabilities. An example of this is shown in the lower panel. Based on these spectral scans, you can begin to make choices about what monochromator settings you will need to have success. Because of its excellent sensitivity, Assays developed on the ClarioStar will easily translate to the Ferristar FSX. 
The Fairstar line has been the gold standard for high-throughput screening, and the FSX moves the bar even higher with improvements in speed and sensitivity. The FSX includes the best possible hardware components for all assays. These components are depicted on the right. From dedicated light sources to truly matched PMTs, and finally, assay-specific modules the FSX has what you need to be sure that assay performance is optimal. This includes the ability to detect two emission signals in a simultaneous fashion. This is advantageous for any assay where two signals are produced because it, is, it not only cuts down on read time, but also reduces the possibility of variation in results that could negatively impact your analysis. The Ferristar FSX has performance parameters that are identical to the Claristar in luminescence. And we have used what we have learned from spectral scans to optimize the optic modules used to detect BRET assays. These features, combined with the simultaneous dual emission detection capability, enable high throughput when using the FSX. The excellent performance of the FSX in BRET assays is well established, as you have, uh, have seen already. And we hope that if you are planning to use BRET, regardless of throughput, you will consider BMG Lab Tech to provide a reader with, excellent set, with the excellent sensitivity that you need. Thank you for taking the time to join us today, and we will now be happy, happy to answer any questions. Okay, I'd uh, like to thank you all, for, all the panelists, for their uh, interesting contributions there. Um, <clears throat> we've got plenty of questions, uh, but not an awful lot of time, so we'll get run, run through them as soon as we can. Uh, and if I could ask um, our speakers to keep the, uh, the answers brief, it would be great. Um, Okay, so the first one, unfortunately Thomas isn't with us this afternoon uh, for the questions and answers, he couldn't make it. So uh, we, uh, the first one is to Kevin, um, but I'm sure that uh, Carl would like to, uh, to answer this one. Um, and the question is uh, about uh, the, uh, it's on the kinetic side of the, of the measurements there. Um, and uh, basically, can the kinetic measurements be read on a full 384 well plate? on a ferrostar? Uh, and if so, is each well sampled multiple times over the plate time course? Time course. Time course. Time course. I, I can answer that if you like, um, Robert. Uh, so it's Kevin here. Um, so the answer is yes. Robert, so it's Kevin here. So the answer is yes. We aren't getting too much uh, uh, feedback on the phone here, but um, we we have uh, we have run with the Ferrostar, and you can do three eight four, and you can run a full plate, and you what you do is you read each well uh, through both wavelength channels, and then go on to the next well, read that, and go round, and then you can go back uh, and and start again from the first well. So so absolutely. Okay, um, this one is for, once again for you, Kevin. Okay, um, this one is... Um, and it is uh, basically, uh, you were saying how good, well, both you and both Thomas were saying how good Brett is at detecting even the smallest changes. Um, could you uh, give uh, the, the, the guy who, who asked the question an estimate for the smallest distance change that could result in a significant Brett signal change? Yes, absolutely. So, um, and in fact, uh, I believe this is, uh, yeah, absolutely. So we have published a paper on this, and I'm happy to forward that paper on to the person asked the question. Um, and the answer is, Brett, uh, the distance change happens very rapidly. So between about two and a half nanometers, and uh, for, this is for Arlucate and Venus combination, between about two and a half nanometers 
and about seven and a half nanometers, there's a rapid change. So if it's less than two and a half nanometers, you won't see much difference. If it's more than seven and a half, you won't see much difference, but it's anywhere in between that range, you'll see a dramatic change. Okay, excellent. Um, so one more question. Um, if antibody receptor binding was studied, uh, does this distinguish the false degraded antibody uh, from the unstressed antibody? Uh, and do you see the difference in the receptor binding? Okay, um, that's an interesting one. Um, and again, I'm happy to, to liaise with the, the person who asked that question offline. We haven't done an awful lot of work with antibodies. So to be honest, I'm not quite sure uh, of the question. Well, I think we can we can certainly put you in touch with each other. Um, all right, one more last question. Yep. For, for the nanobret ligand binding assay, uh, how do the IC50s compare to traditional uh, radio ligand displacement assays? Yeah, they, they compare favorably, absolutely. Good, excellent. Um, all right, look, ladies and gentlemen, unfortunately we've run out of time. I'd like to go through uh, more of your questions uh, with with the panel, um, but obviously they will see the questions and hopefully we can be in touch with each other and follow through on this one. Um, the, please remember that the webinar will be stored on our website, uh, that's uh, ddw-online.com, um, and... Uh, so you can get that on demand if you want to catch up with, uh, with the webinar later on. So once again, a big thank you to our speakers. A thank you to our sponsors, uh, BMG, LabTech, and Promega. Uh, and I, may, I also thank you, our attendees, and hope that we'll see you again for another Drug Discovery World webinar. Thank you very much, and goodbye. <laughs>